Hello, I'm Dee Brown, CEO, and welcome to this episode of Self Made. Joining me on the show today is a mentor-mentee relationship. First, I have Charles Sims, CEO of Sims Financial Group, and I have Cameron Caldwell, president of Caldwell Wealth Management. Welcome to Self Made, gentlemen. Glad to have you on the show today. Hello, Dee. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. How are you doing, Mr. Brown? Thank you for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome. So. I want to start the show off by, first of all, just going back and setting the stage for where you guys come from. And so, uh, Charles, I'm going to defer to you uh, initially. Talk to me about your childhood and where you grew up. Well, thank you, Dave. I, was, I grew up in Memphis, in North Memphis, in inner city, uh, with a father and mother who didn't work outside of the home. And they raised nine children. And so, of course, we didn't have a lot of money. And so we had to pull ourselves about, you know, proverbial bootstraps to make things work out and not necessarily descend into poverty and do things that you shouldn't do. So I worked my way through high school, college. In fact, while I was in college, I had to leave work from working from Plow to go to work for Universal Life so that I would have the flexibility to actually go to school. I've been a young aspiring insurance agent. It gave me that flexibility. And I moved on to John Hancock, which I spent 30 years. And then I formed the Sim Financial Group, Inc. out of Memphis back in 1988. At that time, it allowed us to actually expand our services to provide financial services for individuals in need of it. Our people in our community sometimes don't get the services, in this case, of a certified financial planner. So we found that there are many high net worth individuals in our community that were not being taken care of properly. So we made our mission to make sure that we are going to take care of our people and we're not going to discriminate uh, with other races because that money is also green. No, absolutely. And so what I want to do also is just so uh, our viewers can understand your journey, I want to just uh, backtrack just a little bit just to really talk about some of the challenges that you experienced as a kid growing up in North Memphis. Well, absolutely. When you grow up in the inner city, uh, in the poverty-stricken area of any town, you, you, you're surrounded by crime and sometimes drugs. And you have to learn how to stay away from those kind of things. So we, I remember at 14 years old, Dave, asked my father why we were poor. I thought it was ridiculous to be poor. No one should be poor. Everyone should have money. And I got my first job. At, he, well, he put me to work. Then he gave me a job. You don't be poor, go get a job. So I did get a job at 14. But I kept myself out of trouble. Uh, as you may know, there's a lot of trouble in the inner city. And by working hard and keeping busy while you're in school and you're working, you have less time to get in trouble. So some of the challenges you have in growing up, and once you grow up and you get into the business, uh, back in the 70s when I started financial services, by the way, D, this is my 50th year, 5-0 year in this profession. Wow. And so at that time, you basically had to work with individuals in your own community. You were sometimes left out of the opportunity to do business in the mainstream community, mainstream community rather. And I found that even then, we found a way to break in. As you heard me say before, it's kind of hard to hold someone back when they're busy kicking the door in. Right. So Cameron, I want to uh, pivot to you. Uh, talk to me about your childhood. Where did you grow up? And talk about some of the um, challenges you may have faced. Okay, so I actually grew up in North Memphis too as well. I grew up in the Raleigh area, went to Raleigh Egypt High School. And then once my family saw that the neighborhood was starting to get a little bit bad, we moved to Bartlett, Tennessee, uh -huh. where I ended up finishing my education at Bolton High School. So pretty much in my childhood, I had a pretty good childhood. Yeah. Um, my mom and dad wasn't married, but they still had that strong foundation on raising me and my younger brother. And my mom ended up did getting married in 1998 to my stepfather, in which they're currently still married now. And he has a son, so we pretty much have a blended family. Okay. And with that being said, we pretty much got along and everything. And I had help from all over, from my stepfather's side, 
my dad's side and my mom's side. So I had that help in every part of the families. So I did pretty well. And challenges, I didn't really have too many challenges because I was kind of like that shelter kid who yeah. played sports. So I didn't really have a whole lot of challenges growing up. So what, what was high school like? High school was cool. I was pretty much kind of like one of the popular kids at school. I ran my mouth a lot, got yeah. in trouble with the teachers, but <laughs> <laughs> other than that, you know, high school was, it was, it was a good experience for me. So uh, Charles, I want to uh, pivot back to you, uh, coming out of North Memphis, and obviously you came from uh, an era where there was no conversations around the dinner table about generational wealth. Uh, very little, if any, conversations about investments and savings and those sorts of things. So how did you uh, gain an interest in the financial service industry? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I went to work for Universal Life. It's a black-owned life insurance company. The owner and the founder of Universal Life was A. Maceo Walker. That was the first time I ever met a multi-millionaire black person. And my mentor was Mr. C.A. Taylor, which was the sales manager. He made me who I am today in the financial services because once I went to work for them, thinking I'm just going to sell insurance, they helped me understand finances. I've always had a tendency uh, to be good at numbers. Numbers always have come to me naturally. But basically what happens when you go to work for a company like that, Universal Life, is a we're like a family. And I would not be who I am today without the help I got with the people at Universal Life. My mother and father molded me to be a halfway decent human being, but on a professional level, it took a village. It takes a village for us to all come together and help one another. And basically, uh, that's what got me who I am today. Is the start at Universal Life allowed me to uh, propel myself to other areas, like become a certified financial planner, a stockbroker, someone who, stole, believe it or not, sold uh, tax shelters in the 70s and 80s. Around a uh, dinner table wasn't big enough. You got nine children, a mother and father. That dinner table wasn't big enough for 11 people. Yeah. So basically, it took the village in order to help me get to where I am. I can't get on the show until y'all walk up one day and know how to do all this. So Cameron, I want to uh, come back to you. Uh, walk me through graduating high school and to where you are now. How did, how did you get into the financial service industry? So it was this gentleman that I was friends with at a time. He pretty much told me that, you know, with my personality and the way I can talk to people and make people feel good, he felt as that I should get into financial services. But before that, when I graduated from high school, I pretty much worked in the car industry. I did that for 10 plus years. And the thing was for me, I just got tired of being in that industry. I felt like I wasn't bringing any value to anybody. And so when I met the gentleman that I was friends with, he told me about this industry, and I said, well, I think it might be too hard. I may not want to get into this industry. So I said, I know I pretty much think about it. So once I thought about it, it took me like over a year to think about it. And once I thought about it, I ended up taking the test. I failed the test on the first go round. And with me failing the test, it kind of, you know, put me at a state where I was like, nah, I don't think I can really do this. But you know, I prayed to God and I went back the second time and I ended up passing the course. And that's what made me want to get into the financial services even more when I felt is that I passed that test. And it was a situation where I have a play aunt and she was actually my first client. And I wrote a life insurance policy on her. Three months later, she ended up passing. And so with her passing, wow. I was just like, you know, how many other families are like that? they don't have that financial stability to be able to take care of final expenses or even send a child to college yeah. or even to pay off the mortgage if the breadwinner or anybody, you know, were to have an unexpected death. So that pretty much fueled my fire. And I said, you know, I want to be an advocate in the community to make sure that people of color and other races too as well doesn't have to have a GoFundMe yeah. to end up, you know, paying for the you know, dying person's proceeds. Got you. So Charles, at the Sim Financial uh, Group, what type of services are you providing to um, your clients? Well, beautiful, beautiful. Basically, we provide a full service array of buffet of businesses and services. Uh, provide personal and business financial planning as 
Brother Caldwell just mentioned, life insurance, investment products, retirement planning, and state conservation measures. Because as Brother Caldwell mentioned earlier, a lot of times our people don't have the means to pay for the funeral, let alone replace their income in the event they die or in the event they become disabled. A lot of times, Brother D, we ask people, what is your largest asset? They'll say, my home is my largest at financial asset. But if you got a home with a mortgage on it, it's not an asset, it's actually a liability because you are still paying for it. Their greatest asset is the ability to earn income. So if they become disabled and their income stop, they're not unable to even pay for that thing they call an asset. And if they die, then the income they earn would also go to the grave. So what we try to do is make sure we do a comprehensive financial planning to cover all the areas that could cause them to lose their home, uh, children not being able to go to college. So f- full-blown financial plan is what we do. And in our office, we also have a tax attorney and we also work with CPA. So when clients come to us with a CPA, with an attorney, we also work with them as well. So Cameron, talk to me about uh, Charles and how did you all develop this mentor-mentee relationship? <laughs> so how me and Mr. Sims developed a relationship when I first got into the industry, I went to work for this company called Banker's Life for a short period of time. Mm-hmm. And you don't hear a whole lot of black individuals in this business, and especially the ones that's doing good too. So every time I would go out, I would always hear Charles Sims, Charles Sims, Charles Sims. I'm like, who is Charles Sims? <laughs> and it was one particular person I was trying to actually do some financial planning for. And they was like, well, I already have someone. His name is Charles Sims. And I said, okay, that does it. (laughs) I need to figure out who this Charles Sims gentleman is. So one day on LinkedIn, I connected with him on LinkedIn. I reached out to him and said, hey, I'm continuously hearing your name. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with you. He was very welcoming. We had a conversation. He invited me to his office. We had a conversation. We talked for about three to four months. And, you know, he asked me, hey, Young man, you have a lot of drive. You remind me of myself when I was your age, getting into this industry. And he pretty much just asked me a question, what do I want to do in this industry? And I explained to him, I want to be the one to, you know, help a family pass down generational wealth. Mm. And he asked me, well, I have an opening. Do you want to come work with me? And I was like, did he just ask me, do I want to (laughs) come work with him? I was like, man, this is Charles Sims. (laughs) So, you know, fast forward later, Uh, Me and him end up working together, and I've been working with Mr. Sims now going on three years now, and it's it's been a good relationship. So, Charles, now that um, uh, Cameron has his own uh, company, talk to me about the role you played in his uh, success and why you felt it was important for you to put him in a position where he can go out on on his own. Well, the mentorship that I provide is designed for that very thing. Uh, because this young man has all the potential to be whatever he want to be. He's easy to mentor. He listens. I ride his back a lot. He he takes it pretty well. He able to survive that. I knew he was tough. He has thick skin because he had to have it with some of the things I was doing with him. That's why he's doing so well. So basically, you know, one day I'm not going to be doing this. So I want to make sure that whatever we do, we can pass on this knowledge. We don't want to this is my 50 year in this business. I don't want to accumulate all this knowledge, all this experience, and let it just go to the grave with me. So you got young people like that who has the potential to do well. And he was mentored from the very beginning to be Caldwell Wealth Management. He has extended to that role. He's done a great job in doing so. He's a decent, honorable young man. Very proud of him. He's like a son, a grandson, whichever he what, what you want to be, because I have both that age. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, I just, I, I always wanted to make sure that people that I mentor, we eventually have their own firm. Even though he has his own firm, we still work very closely together right. because he's, he's still growing. He's still growing and uh, he, he takes it well. He takes criticism well. He takes praise uh, pretty well. So uh, he, that was how we uh, got together because he wanted to do better. He wanted to be successful in this business, and I, I'm trying to help him. He's actually been very successful already. So, Cameron, uh, tell me about 
um, your firm, uh, what services services you provide, and how uh, Charles was instrumental in getting to getting you where you are. Okay, so about my firm is Caldwell Wealth Management. We're actually based out of Dallas, Texas, and we offer everything that Mr. Sims said to as well. So pretty much everything that Mr. Sims offer, we offer to as well with a live tax attorney. We have a CPA that we use to help clients with too as well, um, estate conservation, pretty much everything that you can think of, a full, serve, full service financial services firm. And so with Mr. Sims, he pretty much helped me in a lot of ways that I think I would never get to. I'm gonna be honest, I really didn't think I would be doing this right now in this day of time, but you know, just staying faithful to God and listening to what he says, you know, I feel like he led me in the right path. Yeah. So Charles, what do you feel has contributed to your longevity in the industry? 50 years uh, in the financial service industry uh, is, a, is a long time, it's, a, it's a quite of a, a, an accomplishment. So what do you feel has contributed to your longevity? Well, D, uh, unlike the dinosaurs, you have to learn to evolve and always evolve. I've gone to school, I continue to learn. Even after college, I gather several designations I do a lot of continued education. Uh, you have to evolve with the business. I went from a young kid carrying a big book from door to door to sitting in Seaway Bank in Chicago, being the financial advisor for all the senior executives, uh, working with NFL players, NBA players, and other high net worth individuals. Uh, so the only way you can get to that point, you evolve. And basically, I, I started the CFP program, the Certified Financial Planning Program, back in 1986, and I finished it in 1988. That allowed me to work with these people because the competition is very tough at this level. And so the only way you're going to ascend to these levels, you've got to evolve. You cannot be a product-driven individual. And Mr. Caldwell will tell you, we're more a conceptual uh, firm. We make sure that we have this six-step process that we develop. The, uh, the first step, we do talk to them about their goals and objectives. Then we take financial data and we analyze that. We come back, make specific recommendations. If they like those, we implement said recommendations. Then we do periodic review and we stay in close contact with our clients. Our clients is why we're in business today. We know the difference, D, uh, between a client and a customer. A customer may make one purchase from you. You may not ever see he or she again. A client is the one who come back to you day after day, year after year, because you'll continue to service them. So to answer your question, to survive this business, you must evolve. Cameron, uh, he's enrolled to, in a course, he'll tell you about it. When you speak to him, he's also going through the evolutionary process. Right, so Cameron, talk to me about uh, what you're doing to evolve, but also, uh, talk about some of the challenges you face as a young entrepreneur. Okay, so the challenges I have faced is pretty much individuals will probably look at me and say, well, he doesn't have a whole lot of experience. He's just 30 years old. He doesn't know about finance. He doesn't know about life insurance and et cetera. So that's been pretty much the challenge I've had. Individuals will look at me and say, well, he's too young. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But with me being in school at, at the prestigious American College of Financial Services, I'm actually enrolled for my FSCP certification, which is the Financial Services Certified Professional. Mm -hmm. So these are designations of the elite of the elite in the business that, you know, will put you in a different platform than versus just a regular life insurance agent. Yeah. But you get these designations pretty much say that, hey, you put the time, you put the effort in, to do what is needed to be done in this business to be successful. Right. So Charles, talk to me about some of the major achievements you've had in the uh, industry. I know you have been the recipient of numerous awards, uh, but tell me about a few of the awards that you've received, a few of the uh, glass ceilings you've broken uh, in your career. Well, uh, well, one back in 1988, I mentioned earlier, I'm the first African-American certified financial planner in the Southeast USA I didn't know at the time I was. Uh, also, John Hancock has something called their Hall of Fame. I'm the first African-American to ever qualify to enter their Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, longevity has its privileges if you do something with the time. So over the years, because I'm trying to ascend, I'm trying to evolve, it allows me to break in some 
glass ceilings. And one thing you'll learn when you know what you're doing, pe even people who have prejudice tend to get past it because they more look they more so look out for their own welfare. Also, uh, some other glass ceilings we we've had, we've been able to get major contracts from City of Memphis, MLG and W. Uh, also, our county, uh, we've had federal contracts. Uh, FedEx, I was someone they paid a fee to to do financial planning for the executives and their pilots, and other high uh, net worth individuals. So basically, by being in the right place at the right time, have the proper uh, qualifications. It'll allow you to have an opportunity to get those major contracts and break through those class settlements. So, uh, Cameron, <clears throat> the services that you uh, provide are really important services, I mean, for everyone, but really particularly uh, uh, communities of color, uh, because often, oftentimes uh, we lack insurance, we lack retirements, we lack financial planning, those sorts of things. Talk to me about why it's important uh, for someone to utilize your services? It's important because if you love your family and you live for your last name, you will do whatever that's needed to do to make sure that you have generations of wealth in your family. I was actually reading a book today, it's called What Would the Rockefellers Do? And they were talking about John D. Rockefeller and how he accumulated all his wealth in the early 1900s. And now fast forward today, his family is still living off that same wealth that he accommodated back in the early 1900s just with a with a living trust. Right. So it's passed down through six or seven generations. And I feel is that us as color, we need to know about these type of things. And that's where I want to come in at to help my community and say, hey, we can do the same thing, too, as well. We can have life insurance and we can put it in a trust or we can have correct financial planning to help us out you know, when it comes to retirement and things of that nature. So I feel like that's what I'm, I'm here to do for my people. Right. And so, Charles, you know, we've uh, had this conversation before. We've known each other a long time. And, you know, we know that uh, in African-American communities and families, uh, there isn't uh, a big discussion around uh, generational wealth and creating generational wealth. Uh, talk to me about why it's important that we begin to really have these conversations and plan uh, for generational wealth to occur within our communities. Well, if you think about this, I'll give you an example when I was married. My ex-wife is a physician. I was a certified financial planner. We bought this very large house in Germantown. For those of you who are not from Memphis, it's one of the most prestigious community in Tennessee. Well, we, bought, we bought this house. It was empty and had nothing in it. Uh, we we're happy to be there. Across the street, a young couple just out of college, about the same kind of house. We saw Ethan Allen trucks pull up and that other. So we went over there to welcome to the neighborhood. The house was fully furnished. Uh, daddy paid down payment. Other daddy bought the furniture. And we were thinking, we, we, her father, no, my father could afford to do those kind of things. Right. So they were almost at our level already. We were 10 years older than them. And they made a fraction, earned a fraction of what we earned. We, we were income rich, but we cash poor at the time. And you know, so they were able to do that. So you should, your child shouldn't have to start where you start. They should take over where you end it. Right. If you go, you go from a, a, a dollar to a million dollars, and as Brother Caldwell mentioned, if you got the proper legacy planning, you can place that some type of trust so the child start there. Now, let me tell you, what I've done in some of my financial planning, because some people think about Paris Hilton and how possibly people would not do the right thing with their money. Hey, well you, if you want to you get $2 for every dollar you earn, if you don't have a job, you don't get a dime from this trust. You must stay out of trouble. You must go to school. There are certain things you can write in. You can put some golden handcuffs in that trust. And you can then generationally take care of your grandchildren and great-grandchildren, as Brother Caldwell mentioned earlier the Rockefellers, the Kennedys. Generational wealth is very important. And to do that, we also got to take time to do business in our community, in the Jewish community. That dollar circulates seven to nine times. Sometimes I don't get past the liquor store or the pawn shop. And when it does, it goes somewhere else. We got to learn, first of all, Brother Caldwell myself, myself tell you, you must be qualified. We don't want you to come to us because of our skin color. We also must be qualified. But give us an opportunity. Give us a chance to do business with you. 
if we if we find a small fact, do business with us. But don't do business with us just because it's about skin color. So it's very important that we have you know, financial uh, and legacy planning. And I like to look at financial literacy. We do quite a bit of financial literacy. We do asset protection. What good does it do to accumulate millions of dollars and you have no provisions in place to protect that wealth? Hey, Charles, you you made a, I hate to cut you off, but you made a very important point, and uh, we're running out of time, so, but I, so I want to close on this note. Uh, I think the key to what you said is planning, that we uh, have failed to, uh, as, as a, a community, to plan for the next generation. And so I'm going to leave it right there. I want to thank both of you gentlemen for your time uh, being on the show today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with me. To my viewers, I want to thank you for watching this episode of Self Made with D. Brown, CEO. And remember, without you, there's no me.